Well, welcome. I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Montana Careers in Biotech. Today's session is co-hosted by the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, and we are recording this session. The video will be made available on our website and emailed to everyone who registered today. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat, or you can unmute and um, speak using your microphone at the question point where we ask questions. And we also have a few questions that we collected in advance, and we'll be sharing those as well. I would now like to turn the floor over for a minute to Nicole Rush, Deputy Director at Missoula Economic Partnership, to say a few words on behalf of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative. Nicole? Thanks, Christina. And uh, thank you all for attending this presentation today. I'm here on behalf of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, which is a five-year project funded by the Small Business Administration and working to support Montana's expanding biotech industry. Our initiative is led by the University of Montana, the Montana World Trade Center, Montech, which is UM's technology incubator here in Missoula, the Montana Bioscience Alliance, Swan Valley Medical, and Missoula Economic Partnership. And together we're working to provide training, mentorship, advocacy, small grants, and workforce development to this important sector. And as I'm sure many of you know, Montana has a rich history of success and innovation in bioscience. And over the next decade, it's predicted that this industry's market share will triple, creating incredible career opportunities in biotech. We think it's really important that Montanans are aware of these great opportunities and the types of career options available to them. And so thanks to the Montana High Tech Alliance for supporting this presentation and to our industry panelists for sharing their career stories. And if you'd like to learn more about the initiative, you can visit our website at mtbioscience.com. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, today, we're pleased to hear from three Montana innovators who are working at the intersection of the biosciences and technology. Uh, first, we have Karen Brown, PharmD, who is founder and CEO of Clio Research in Missoula. I'm going to define my panelists here to highlight them. Okay, we also have Moses Levins, who is a, a PhD, who is a protein biochemist at McLaughlin Research Institute in Great Falls. And finally, Andreas Scherer who is president and CEO of Golden Helix in Bozeman. And with that, we're gonna kick off with some questions. So for our panelists, um, could you start by telling us the story of your own career, where you're from, your education, and your career path up to now? And maybe we can just go in the order in which I introduced you, which is also alphabetical. So we'll begin with Karen. Sure, thanks, Christina. Um, yeah, my name is Karen Brown. I grew up in Montana. I'm a Montana gal. I grew up working on a farm in central Montana, right outside of Great Falls. Um, and when I say small, I mean small. So I graduated with 25 kids in my class. Um, but, but growing up in that area, I really did have a strong interest in, in science and, and did the science fairs and robotics and um, all of those opportunities that I had at my fingertips. And I also grew up, my mo mom was a nurse. So I had some, uh, some ability to see in, in, into healthcare. And I think I kind of took that, uh, took those influences and combined them and ended up in Missoula going to pharmacy school. So I worked through, um, pharmacy school. I had two little girls I earned my PharmD in 2020, and I um, completed my postdoc in pharmacogenomics um, soon afterwards. And then I launched Clio as uh, a consulting firm for medical device and biotech companies. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. Moses? You have to unmute. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. Sorry about that. 
So, hello, my name is Moses Levins. I also am uh, uh, from the Great Falls area, actually born and raised uh, right here in Great Falls. Um, kind of, I mean, to be honest with you, I really didn't know what I wanted to really do out of high school. Um, I, I kind of wanted to be like a teacher and a coach and ended up taking a bunch of math classes in college and you know, some of my family members had some infectious diseases. That was really interesting to me um, and got me interested in uh, viruses and the field of virology and immunology. And um, I went to, um, so I graduated from CM Russell High School here in Great Falls uh, back in 03, getting pretty old. And um, I, I stayed here for college. I actually uh, went to MSU Great Falls, which is a community college, and um, just took a bunch of general education courses, and that's and including math courses, and that's when I got kind of hooked on math, and I got interested in you know viruses, and I thought I wanted to be this virologist, and um, I ended up getting my uh, bachelor's degree from uh, University of Great Falls, or also known as University of Providence now, and. Um, Briefly did some graduate work in St. Louis, Missouri, and moved back to Montana. Worked for a little bit in environmental health and realized that wasn't really something I wanted to pursue as a career, and I missed doing research. And so I applied to UM uh, in the biochemistry and biophysics program. Uh, I started there in 2013, finished my degree there in 2019. I ended, I ended up going down to Hamilton, Montana to do a postdoc at NIAD, which is part of the NIH Rocky Mountain Labs. And I was there for three years and uh, got hired here at McLaughlin earlier this year in Great Falls. And this is where I am. Excellent. Thank you, Moses. And Andreas. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Scherer. As you can hear, I'm not from Montana. Uh, I was born in uh, Germany. Um, the, the short story on the career is um, as a kid and in high school, math was always easy for me. And I started to get interested in programming pretty quickly. So when I was 15, I started programming. Um, and um, <clears throat> so the, the language progression was basic Pascal and I started very early on with C and that actually was my first job. Still, um, so right out of high school and while I went to college, I was paid to program in C, which actually funded my, my studies. I finished, uh, or I started a computer science degree uh, in combination with uh, medicine in Germany and actually had a, my master's thesis was on DNA sequence analysis on a very specific topic. Um, and when I finished it, uh, at that time there was in this area, DNA sequence, there, was no, there were no jobs. This was all super researchy. So um, actually I accepted then in a different area, um, a PhD po uh, job. Uh, I focused on AI and neural networks and finished that in uh, 1994. And the same thing, the, the, the AI was at that time still super early, so there were no jobs. I uh, made then my first professional and commercial uh, attempts in, uh, at HP. Uh, I was in charge for their uh, internet security of all places, and it was a almost a funny story because I had just some, uh, uh, as part of my work in, in science, I had some exposure to internet stack and internet technologies. And that was then what helped me at HP to advance. I then took over first uh, professional services for Netscape in Europe, and then became global vice president for uh, professional services here in the United States. So that job brought me here over in, uh, to the US. And, um, uh, was in charge <clears throat> probably just a few years after my PhD of uh, 600 people and $100 million in revenue. It was an insane development for me personally. Um, 
and then over the last 20 years of my career, I managed uh, essentially private companies. 10 years ago, I um, invested and took over Golden Helix. At that time, the company was uh, very much research focused. And um, while that is an interesting space um, conceptually and you know intellectually, um, I uh, bent or uh, changed the strategy and moved the company into the clinical space. And I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so that is like in, in, in a nutshell, my career. Wrote a few books in, the, in, the, in between. Oh, excellent. Also an author. Yeah. All right. Well, now give us an idea. Each of you work for different organizations, in some cases um, are running companies. So maybe give us an overview of your um, who you work for and what you do uh, and what that company or organization does. And maybe we'll go in the same order um, as the <clears throat> introductions. Sure. Uh, so I founded Clio Research. It's a contract research organization. Um, and really my origin story for it, I was finishing up pharmacy school and I decided that traditional pharmacist roles really weren't going to be for me. Um, and I had to take a good look at, at what I wanted to do with my career. So I leaned into some of the experiences that I had um, doing research and into the network that I had at the time. And I started consulting in the healthcare space. And so kind of having that clinician background, I really, really enjoyed because um, I had intimately seen the messiness that is healthcare. And I really wanted to launch Clio to, beca to become a disruptor um, in the medical industry. So uh, Clio as a company really is, is disruptive because it's nimble. It's using high quality outsourced labor and really we run really lean and mean and do the work that is required. So our competitors in the contract research organization space are typically large companies that have massive amounts of overhead and bureaucracy and they really can't support um, the small organizations that are trying to bring health innovation to market. So what we do is provide that clinical affairs piece or the regulatory um, reimbursement or market access um, and even just medical writing strategy and support to these companies. Thanks, Karen. Moses? So <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm not a business owner. Um, maybe, but what I do a little bit, I would say, is innovative, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I work at McLaughlin Research Institute in Great Falls, and it's a nonprofit research institute that's been around since 1954 here in Great Falls, Montana. Um, it has an interesting history. The research focus has sort of changed over the over the years. Initially, it was started um, by a physician who was recruited here from Utah. And um, part of his uh, being recruited to the hospital here in Great Falls was that um, he had a research space laboratory to do research. And at that time, they were doing tissue transplantation. And I would say, and so this was 1954. And over the past few decades, that's changed and got into immunology research. And for the past 25 years or so, McLaughlin has specifically studied neurodegeneration. So different diseases like uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, diseases of the brain where uh, different uh, sets of neurons are, are killed uh, in these diseases. And what I do specifically here one of the main things uh, my lab does is we, we use human tissue um, for certain neurodegenerative diseases because that tissue has some information in there that we are um, trying to use as a biomarker. So specifically misfolded proteins, or we call them protein seeds, they're abundant in all these different diseases, even outside of the brain uh, with diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. 
So there's, there's different proteins, but basically what we do is we use a technology, a protein seeded technology, uh, where we basically use this human tissue and we're able to amplify these protein seeds like PCR, if you will, except this isn't DNA, this is misfolded protein that we're detecting and amplifying. Okay. So we try to get the assays real sensitive and uh, specific for that disease. And if it works in the postmortem tissue, then we then migrate to pre-mortem tissue, such as spinal fluid. Great, thank you, Moses. Andreas? So um, <clears throat> Gordon Helix develops diagnostic pipelines. Um, it's for based on NGS, the next gen sequencing technology. So um, the most important use case is cancer. The cancer is the disease of the genome. And uh, what we do today is we sequence the tumor, um, either <clears throat> solid biopsy or liquid biopsy. That's actually uh, very interesting these days. So you don't have to even get to the tumor. You just take a blood sample. And then based on that, we can find the uh, driver mutations, um, cross-references with all the FDA-approved drugs, all the uh, clinical trials that are available, and then create a clinical report. And um, <clears throat> so the topic is now um, uh, well into the clinic. So we're uh, addressing not only how to do this, but also how to do this very efficiently and, and well, and how we, how we can scale. So some of our customers have thousands of samples a month, so it needs to be done um, with high quality, but also with high throughput. The same pipelines can be used to uh, analyze germline diseases. Uh, so that's a second very important part of our uh, value proposition. And then um, obviously uh, prenatal screening is, uh, is a third topic um, very related to germline diseases. So we have a global customer base. Um, we do business on every continent, focuses uh, besides, United, besides Northern America, it's Europe, and then Asia and Australia. Is, those are the strongest markets. Some business in the Middle East, and then some in uh, just a little in Latin America and Africa. Fantastic. So maybe now tell us what is a typical day like for you uh, in your job, in your roles? What, do you, what would you typically do? Maybe we'll start in reverse order. So Andreas, maybe you can start and then we'll go um, back around. Yeah. Yeah, so um, um, I'm trying to be super uh, in tune with customers. So I try to uh, talk as much as possible with customers. Typically starts with calls with uh, European clients in the morning. Uh, that's that can be happening on any possible on, on any day and then over the week I touch with every aspect of the company uh, so I, I have um, uh, Monday morning sales marketing operations and then um, uh, on Fridays I touch uh, for instance with the the engineering and the field application uh, team and then during the week there are specialized meetings so I try to touch every aspect marketing operations and and so on so that we have our projects lined up management team meetings on uh, on Thursday and in between um I spend time with um if it's not with customers I have always uh, either some business development that I focus on or you know we have things like um getting company valuation started or tax preparation or uh, look outside consultants that help us to um, sharpen the uh, sharpen uh, our processes and um, our uh, approach to business so um, pretty much that's my day and then I actually tr I'm personally then spend uh, using the time in the late afternoon evening for my workout or playing piano or socializing obviously hanging out with my friends and family so uh, I'm not one of those people that uh, show up at five o'clock in the gym just to beat the day so I never figured this out in my life for some reason I think that sounds like a good day yeah Moses how about you um I mean, typical day, a lot of it's spent writing, whether it's like manuscript writing or grant writing. Um, I would say that's like, that's a good, good chunk of the day. Um, 
also troubleshooting. So like, since you're, when you're running your own lab, like people work in the lab, right? But there's always issues um, that come up. And so whether it's like issues with purification or issues with like growing bacteria or issues with an experiment, like usually I have to get up and go in the lab and help troubleshoot and um, sort of steer the research like back into a, you know, a, a good progressive direction. I guess like running your own lab, I guess, you know, I kind of think of it as like, you know, you're sort of in the driver's seat. So you're kind of, I think a good, a good amount of time is spent just like thinking of ideas, right? So like reading papers, like I spend a lot of time reading and I guess I'm sort of always looking for connections, right? And so like, if I'm reading about like disease A and disease B, and there's like maybe some misfolded protein that's common between the two diseases. And, you know, um, that's kind of what I'm focusing on right now. And then I'm trying to figure out like, you know, maybe common pathways or mechanisms that are involved in both diseases. And then that kind of like gets my brain thinking about like, you know, maybe a new uh, grant, grant proposal idea. And so then I got to gather preliminary data. Um, but that's, that's most of the day, I would say. It's writing, reading, helping people in the lab, troubleshoot, training sometimes. Um, and that's probably the gist of it. Karen? My days are a little bit all over the place right now. Um, I have a, like I said, I, I think before a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And so some days, like today, my five-year-old's out of school at 11, so I'm back and forth and back and forth and just being a mom. Uh, but work-wise, you know, I, I've i really built a process for myself. Um, I call it a, an accountability workflow um, that gets me to my desk in the morning at a certain time and um, gets me to go through my emails and get to inbox zero by the end of the day. Um, other than that, it's a lot of talking to people on the phone. It's a lot of emails and uh, a lot of contracts and proposals. So that's the bulk of it. Very good. So next question is about what is required to have a career like yours. And so this could be if somebody wanted to literally follow in your footsteps or if someone wanted to work for your organization. What education, internships, or experience would they need to be qualified to do that work? And we can go in any order. So anybody who's ready, uh, go ahead and, and turn off your mic and share. Turn it on, I mean. I have a list. <laughs> All right, go ahead and start us off. Um, so just I, I think I should just talk about... Um, not about me yet to sort of talk about uh, what it takes or what roles we fill. I have um, on the engineering side, we're preferring full stack engineers, uh, which means they have um, a, a competency in developing UIs, but also have a full understanding of data structures and can build um, algorithms. Um, and that's pretty much um, the, the versatility that we need to use them in, in, in different ways as, as there is a need. Uh, I prefer uh, people with, um, I mentioned C, it's still relevant and I like people with, with that level of programming skills and then TypeScript and so on. Um, the, uh, on the field applications, and um, it honestly doesn't matter if they have a master's or a bachelor or if they're self-taught, we happen to have people um, with masters and PhDs for the most part, but that is not that is just how things evolve. Um, there is no in computer science actually not really that such of a strong need for a degree I've, I found. And I'm and even though I have a PhD, I would say I rather have people with strong uh, um, programming skills that they have somehow developed than someone just with theoretical background. On the field application scientist role, that is now an interesting topic. We have um, primarily people with PhDs in biology, actually, that who have actually a very good understanding of genomics natively. And um, the, what we found is that the biologists have strong communication skills. 
So they can, they are very adaptable in because of their training to various user requirements. So the entire team is basically made of that. But we would be open to other people with scientific background. A PhD or an advanced degree helps to communicate with our customers with such almost exclusive, uh, which almost exclusive, uh, exclusively have PhDs. So it helps them a little bit to navigate that uh, that clientele. Um, on the sales side, uh, working knowledge in genetics is important. But other than that, strong prospecting capabilities and the uh, ability to handle dozens or you know, really multiple multiples of dozens of transactions in parallel. So that is there important and being good communicator, obviously. Um, I will say that not in my company, but in other companies, I have seen people actually coming from science with PhDs and being super successful uh, in sales. And I want to mention that because it's uh, sometimes overlooked. We, we scientists are so proud of the knowledge that we have generated for ourselves that we want to hold on to it. But the reality is that um, sales in itself uh, Besides starting a company, it will be one of the few areas left where you can almost unlimitedly generate income for yourself. So I, I want to give the scientists here this as a, at least as a thought that they can put in their mind. So similarly for marketing, um, working knowledge of genetics, and then there we are seeing in marketing the need for strong technical competency uh, in CRM, uh, analytics, uh, anything that has to do with web analytics. Um, um, marketing automation. So that it, it, uh, uh, marketing has become super technical now in these days. And then in operations, I'm looking for people who are very good in financial modeling, modeling, pro forecasting, but then also, of course, QuickBooks, this and tax preparation, that and so on. That's probably the area in my company where you have to have the least uh, knowledge, uh, domain knowledge in, in, in our field. Having that said, um, we have... Um, a, a genetics training for non-scientists that everybody goes through. So including the, the finance people in my company uh, so that they can relate better to their colleagues. So I find this very important so that everybody understands why we're actually doing things or why we have products in, in, in certain uh, segments of the market. So that's in a nutshell. I'm hiring in a bunch of these areas, by the way. So I have uh, a director of finance right now that I'm looking for. I have a director of renewals. It's a very strategic uh, role from, for my company where um, the person will be in charge for next year, $7 million of renewal business. So we're looking for someone who's able to take that to the next level and has the ability to deal with international clients. And then I have um, an, an open position for a full stack engineer. Excellent. Maybe, maybe one yeah. of those candidates is in our audience today. Yeah, uh, hit me up. All right. All right. How about for Moses or Karen, what would you say um, is required for someone to get a job like yours or in your organization? Go ahead, Karen. You know, I I work with a, a wide range of uh, educations, I would say. Um, Typically, the majority of them are PhD or, or master's, um, but really, I've, I, I would say that the majority of people that I love to work with um, are great communicators. They're, um, they're very open and nimble and, and ready to innovate, and they can manage their time really well um, as I work with um, primarily contractors. Uh, having them be able to hold themselves accountable is, is a big issue for me. Mm -hmm. um, in the clinical research space, which is really where my expertise comes in, um, we obviously offer a suite of services, but in the clinical research space, the majority of people who get into clinical research really kind of fall into it. Uh, they, they don't seem to follow one career path. So I work with fantastic um, engineers, fantastic nurses, uh, uh, fantastic people who didn't even uh, think about sciences, but learned how to consent patients or, or were um, talented in that way. So uh, a really wide range of, of people for our company. Great, Moses. 
Um, so at McLaughlin Research Institute, we have I probably didn't go over the structure yet of this company, but basically a large part of the Institute is our animal resource facility or our animal resource center. So we house mice, but it's in the thousands. I don't know how many mice cages we have in the animal resources, <laughs> but we have we have quite a few. And there's a lot of our staff who work here at McLaughlin, I would say half of our employees or maybe at least a third uh, work in the, in the ARC, the Animal Resource Center. So they're either like cage wash technicians where they're washing cages or they're um, they do a lot of mouse behavioral tests. So I mentioned McLaughlin is a neurodegeneration kind of research focus. So a lot of our mouse models of these diseases, like it's required for people to uh, supervise the mice and like change out their cages, like give them fresh water, fresh food, do mouse behavioral tests, uh, memory tests, um, uh, rotor rod for, um, for things like ALS, so you can sit a sit a mouse on a rod and 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 uh, measure how long they stay on the rod. And so when mice have ALS, they don't stay on the rod very long at all. They fall right off because ALS is a muscular disease. Um, so that's the ARC. And like I said, it's about probably 35, 40 percent of the employees here at McLaughlin work in the ARC. So we have an ARC director and then a bunch of people who work under her. So super important for research, uh, those people. And it depends on the position in the ARC. So if you just, I don't even think a, a four-year degree is required. I think we have people working in our ARC um, just with you know, a high school diploma. And um, so it, it, it depends, I guess, the level of the ARC. If you're doing more behavioral tests and stuff, probably some mouse experience in a, in a bachelor's degree like in biology is required. Um, Okay, so that's the ARC. And then in the research laboratories, we have lab technicians, we have research assistants, and we have postdocs, and then we have research faculty. So different, different levels, um, the lab techs and the research assistants um, all have a four-year degree in biology or chemistry um, or some kind of science. Um, and they're, they're the ones, you know, they're kind of the work courses that are doing all the research like at the bench and stuff. Um, and then postdocs also are, are doing research, but then they're developing like their own projects and things. So postdoc, you have to have a PhD, come do a postdoc at McLaughlin. If you're a lab tech or an RA, just a four-year degree in science is required uh, to work here. Um, ARC, like I said, it depends on the position, but um, usually some kind of mouse, mouse experience. Working with mice. Um, I guess things we look for, um, we're actually a pretty diverse institution. Um, McLaughlin actually is primarily run by women. Um, I think I think me and another fellow here are the only research faculty here that are that are male. Uh, the rest of the research faculty here are all women. So we have seven research faculty, me and six others, and two of us are male and the rest are female. Uh, the president of McLaughlin is female. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's primarily women who work here at McLaughlin, which is kind of interesting because probably a long time ago, like, you know, science was a man's field, right? Or, you know, engineering, um, but McLaughlin actually is mostly run by women. Mm -hmm. Um, I think things we look for, um, you know, we hired a few research assistants right out of college in the spring, just this year, uh, when I got to the Institute and I mean, we look for, you know, productivity, work ethic. Um, you know, if you have a strong work ethic, but maybe don't have, you know, maybe, you know, no publications, or uh, maybe you've done a little bit of bench work, like, you know, if we can sense that maybe you have enough work ethic, like, likely we'll take a risk and, and hire you. Um, because I, th I feel a lot of training, especially before you come here, like a lot of people I trained this summer, I was training five people in the lab, three summer interns, and then two uh, research assistants. And I was doing all the training, but, you know, we just, we look for some basic things. Like, do they have a four-year degree? Uh, 
you know, is it evident from their references that they're, uh, you know, that they worked hard? Um, and, you know, and, and sometimes that to me is more important than, you know, whether or not you have a publication or, um, you know, how much experience do they have? If it's very little, like a lot of us here, especially in Great Falls, um, it's kind of expected, like a lot of RAs that we interview, a lot of them don't have a ton of research experience. Like maybe they were a, a teaching assistant in a lab and they made like some media and some uh, auger plates or something. So, uh, but yeah, work ethic. Um, I, I like people who have ideas and are creative. And I think that's super important for doing research and science, especially to be competitive um, with grants and, and just with, you know, with uh, projects is that you just have, you know, that you have good, good ideas. So, um, and that's it. And I didn't go through our administration, but we do have an administrative team here. Uh, uh, we have a chief financial officer. We have a clinical coordinator who's like coordinating clinical trials, like with the research we do for more translational medicine. Um, and we have uh, a development director who does like a lot of outreach and um, kind of community engagement. So she organized our open house here tonight for the Great Falls community to come and businesses to come tour the labs here. Um, and so, yeah, that makes up most of our administration team. And then we have maintenance folks. So McLaughlin's a good sized building. So we kind of need a full-time maintenance person for like HVAC issues. Uh, the mice are real sensitive to temperature fluctuations and things. So it's, it's critically important that we have someone here who can address those issues. So. It's interesting. Thank you. So my next question for all of you is what do you love about your work? I can go first. I'll, all right. I'll be brief. Um, so basically, um, what I love about my job, and it's the, it's the main driver why I went back to school um, and, and pursued a research career, because what I was doing previously in environmental health, you know, inspecting restaurants and um, approving septic systems in the county, that was something like I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. And I was I really missed doing uh, research. And I think what it boils down to is I like the unknown and I like sort of the mystery of life. And that's really what got me into research. Like when I was a kid, you know, I used to watch Unsolved Mysteries on television, you know, the guy in the trench coat and stuff. And um, I, I was really intrigued and interested in, you know, cold case murders and, um, you know, oh, they don't know, you know, and like coming up with all these ideas, like maybe how, um, you know, crimes get solved. And at one point, actually, before I got into research, I actually really considered being a detective, <laughs> like an actual detective for, you know, like crime scenes and stuff and solving things. So. I don't know, I like to solve problems and I like the mystery of science and, um, you know, and I think that's just sort of my investigative nature and like why I'm here because I really like doing those things. So like in the lab, like certain diseases, like you're trying to figure stuff out, like, I don't know, like, you know, has anyone tried this or, you know, sometimes you're just trying things, but I mean, they gotta be good ideas. Like they gotta be reasonable and like some evidence in the literature, right? Just not something right out of left field. Um, but yeah, so like I'm a protein folding, misfolding, you know, kind of scientist. So I study like these misfolding diseases that are in the brain. We're trying to figure out, okay, how many misfolded proteins are like in this disease? And so, you know, we we just kind of use tools of biochemistry <laughs> and, and biophysics to kind of like figure this stuff out. And I don't know. It's really fun. I mean, I feel like to me, it doesn't really feel like a job. Like I get up like, oh gosh, I got to go to work. Like I kind of actually like, you know, I'm excited like to be in the lab and, and to do research and stuff. And, and I think even like troubleshooting and going through frustration, like why isn't this experiment working? You know, things like that. Like, I really think that helps with like growth and just, you know, and it builds, I think it builds character and just being persistent. So um, that's what I love about my job, I guess. Like, it's hard, but I think it can be really rewarding, too, especially what we're doing. Like, you know, who knows how many people maybe one day we might help. We don't know. You know, we 
just gotta we gotta just show up and and do it. So that's all. Excellent. Thank you, Moses. Andreas, what do you love about your work? Um, well, there's a cold capitalistic answer to this, and that is like a, I like that I have an appreciating asset that um, continues to appreciate, and that's actually um, not unimportant. If I look at my work day to day, what I like is um, the the job here at Golden Helix actually pushes me at every aspect of my background, you know, scientifically from a business perspective. So uh, and, uh, certain areas where um, I have a certain level of mastery and in other areas where I just dabble in and uh, learn on the job and continue to learn a job. So I advance uh, in, in that area. So I like that. Um, definitely, and I can speak for the entire Golden Helix team, we have a purpose. Our products are being used globally. Uh, we have hospitals testing labs using our products. Um, a great example now for population level health is the country of Denmark that is using our product to geno uh, to genos uh, uh, type uh, at this point 60,000, but uh, at some point eventually they want to uh, uh, sequence every Danish citizen and want to gain uh, population level health insights and our infrastructure, our products are being used for that. So everybody here walks into the company has a purpose and is identifying with the purpose and is proud of what we're doing because uh, uh, there is an improved improvement of health outcome for patients involved with that. Um, and then me personally, as a, as a guy who runs a show at the level of self-direction I have in my life uh, is probably the highest it was ever in my life. So at any time, um, I decide what I do and where I focus on. And that is um, incredibly motivating. Of course, um, I have a lot of responsibilities too. So you can't be random with that. And I probably work harder than I ever have worked, but um, I'm still telling that myself and I control myself, my own destiny and so on. Um, so those are the things that make the job enjoyable. And the reason why I do it is, but comes back to my capitalistic motivation. Yeah. That's a reason too. Yeah. <laughs> Karen, how about you? Yeah, I, I echo a lot of what Andrea said and I and, and Moses in that, you know, bringing better health innovations to market and, and helping patience is is really rewarding um and i i really think that working with people i would have never guessed that i could get into the rooms that i can get into now or or meet the people that i have been able to meet um and travel to the places that i've been able to travel so um i think being able to marry kind of that humanistic part of doing business and the science um, expertise that that comes from my background has been just really rewarding. I get to be really creative and problem solve and yeah, just hang out with cool people. That's great. Well, I wanna make sure we allow time for our audience to ask questions as well. I have more questions if needed, but I wanted to open the floor. We did have some questions submitted in advance. Um, Cheryl Minnick, I can, I can read these questions, but if you would like to ask them yourself, I wanted to give you the opportunity if you wanted to turn on your mic and ask. Okay. I'm just going to read them. So Cheryl um, works for the College of Humanities and Sciences at the University of Montana um, in their career center. And she wants to know, and I think this could apply to any of our higher education institutions in Montana, but how can UM improve and connect more students to career building experiences in biotech? So I'll just go real quick um, and be brief. Because I saw we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so McLaughlin has a summer research program. And in the past, it's been for like 
local local high school or college students sort of from the area, but we're opening it up now to, to have two different programs. So one program is strictly gonna be for um, high school science students who might be interested in biomedical research and they can apply and um, come work for a summer for eight weeks, um, just learning how to do research and see if you enjoy it. Um, same thing with the college students. Um, and they can be from anywhere. Uh, we're starting a college program starting this summer of 2023. And um, same kind of deal. You'll have like a research project for the summer, develop like some skills, depending on what lab or whose lab you're working with. So we're pretty diverse uh, in terms of the labs. Like we got, you know, immunology, we have like cell culture, cell biology, biochemistry, stem cells. We have different stuff here. So working with mice. So a lot of different stuff, um, but that's primarily one way that, you know, our uh -huh. institute can help, you know, Montana uh, students. Um, I will say real quick that we actually, it's interesting that her, she mentioned that, that, like, how can we, you know, connect? Because we actually have a hard time kind of like connecting with like colleges in Montana, like, hey, can you like, advertise our summer program and things. So I, f I feel like the publicity and maybe the marketing of our summer research program can probably be better uh, uh -huh. communicated, um, but I'm not really responsible for that. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it, I, I thought it was an interesting question. Any other input on how else our higher educational institutions could connect students to career building experiences in biotech? I think that's a great question. I actually maintain a research scientist position at the University of Montana, so, but my, my opinions are my own. I think that uh, it would be really beneficial to start thinking about what type of um, corporate sponsorships um, and corporate boards could could facilitate both, you know, funding, but also just connecting to bring in speakers and and give exposure um, to students and to do building tours and um, take these the corporate um, executives through our um, facilities to to show them what you know pathways there are for a smaller college like the University of Montana to get out um, get our students trained um, for uh -huh. industry because um, I think a lot of that infrastructure is there um, however kind of getting those resources in and um, building those connections I think is really important uh -huh. yeah I we have we are so specialized uh, when we hire people even ent uh, entry level or otherwise we it takes us typically a year to get someone fully up to speed so that's why for my company the two months three months even summer intern is there's no efficacy this it's not efficient uh, but um i had good experiences with people that like i in my, my own life started early on with programming for instance and then worked in parallel while getting my degrees I'm open to those and we're open to those and that is not a bad way to start early i would say in terms of what i find when i get people uh we have to sometimes go back to the basics uh so and i would say re almost regardless of what field some of the core competencies today that you will need in one way or the other as a scientist or otherwise actually have to do with coding because you will run into some sort of coding challenge um, doing statistical analysis with R, right? Some sort of that there's scripting involved. So having that skill as a foundational skill. And the other one I would say surprisingly is public speaking, the ability to communicate. Um, because <clears throat> the, uh, uh, and I speak now for my domain, but I'm sure this is not much different here for Moses and for Karen. Um, none of the problems that we tackle are solvable by one human. It's always a team that solves a problem. And um, if you 
it, no matter how bright you are, you will be never never alone in solving something. And your ability to communicate with others and to um, maybe overcome differences um, or uh, have external conversations, that ability defines your success. And uh, whether your so your ideas and your competencies actually make it into the into the domain or are getting lost because nobody buys into what you have to say, and uh, we are we're we're picking there up and and uh, train people on, on those levels, but that can occur earlier. I think that can occur um, more pronounced and more more um, with more emphasis um, at the university level. As a follow up question, so clearly, Andreas, your Golden Helix and your company is, you know, you're in software, but I wonder for Moses and Karen, have you seen that some coding skills are useful in clinical research or in um, the biological sciences? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say they're even kind of um, imperative. Uh, I started coding in R um, when I was going through biostatistics um, and took some of those classes to kind of supplement um, my PharmD degree since it is more of a clinician degree. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, that was one of my first projects um, when I got out into consulting was uh, data analysis through our. Yeah, um, I don't know when we're opening up this position, but we're actually going to be hiring for a full time data scientists, basically, because we're generating so much data that like a lot of people doing the experiments or even me, like we don't have a whole lot of time to be analyzing data. That's no, sort of no. echoed across all the labs here at McLaughlin is like, we have so much data, but, you know, then we got to find time to, you know, and whether it's during the evenings or odd hours, you know, to analyze this data. So, that's one position that we're uh, going to be hiring for sometime uh, soon. I don't know when. Um, and then the other thing, we had a summer, or I personally had a summer intern uh, who had a lot of programming knowledge this summer in the lab. And, you know, he was able to write a program or write a Python script for us that was like tremendously useful. <laughs> and we could just like, you know, ha have our file and like he could he could go grab the file and like run through it, you know, and through uh -huh. the script and and analyze what we were looking for. And you could spend probably hours like on Excel or like GraphPad Prism or some other software right. or like doing this. And so that was very efficient, like to have that. Um, and so yeah, it's it's almost. I imagine in the future some of that might even be required for some science positions that you have some uh -huh. kind of programming knowledge or you know that you're good at uh, you know some kind of different software and you can analyze data very well. Um, oh. I, I almost wish personally that I had taken more programming classes like when I was in college. Like I took a lot of science classes, I took a lot of math classes, took very little. I think I took like one or two programming classes. And yeah, so yeah, it's very useful. Uh, you can argue it belongs in the high school, to be honest. Um, uh, it, it, it should be starting much earlier. Um, and the, the reality is that for kids with a little bit of a math inclination, programming is, you learn it like that, you know, and then the later, longer it takes, I'm trying to get our FESs, then when they have their PhD done, more focusing on programming, and it takes longer. All right? So. Learn it early. That's a good yeah. tip. Learn it early. Yeah. Are there other questions from our audience? Feel free to turn on your mic and and speak up if you have a question, or you can type it in the chat. If anybody has a burning question, okay. Uh, I've got Hearing one. You. Oh, go ahead. Um, a little bit more geared towards the uh, the bench science, more bench scientist roles. Um, how necessary is a postdoc for a, a newly graduating PhD for those type of roles in biotech? I know it's it's essentially it's basically a necessity for uh, academic positions, but how necessary is it for biotech positions? Is it still just as much of a necessity there? I 
guess I'll, I'll, so I did basic science for my PhD, like just a lot of hardcore, like biophysics kind of protein folding experiments. And then I went and did a postdoc that was much more applied science. So working with human tissue and, you know, for these different brain diseases and basically trying to detect or pick up these protein seeds that are in the brain or in the spinal cord. Um, and I spent like three years doing that as a postdoc, really just developing assays, like assay development. And, um, it takes a lot of time. I, I kind of wish I would have maybe done a, something maybe a little additional besides that, but I did it for three years. And I think that's, you know, one reason I probably got hired here is they were really interested sort of more in the innovative side of like developing these novel biomarkers for like certain neurodegenerative diseases. And so um, I guess long story short, um, I, I don't know, I guess I don't know the answer to that, but typically um, you could go do a postdoc for like a year or two or, you know, and then go right into industry or um, I think though, if you want to go the academia route, typically people postdoc a little longer, but, um, but, but I guess what we're doing here could still be considered biotechnology, like these little protein seeded assays that we're developing, like this is kind of novel, novel stuff. And so, um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question, but those were my thoughts. Great. Sharon, did you have a question? First, I have to figure out how to unmute myself. I just was going to um, have Andreas tell us about the recent award that they got from Golden Helix. For <laughs> we were, we were, yeah. <laughs> I've watched this company since before Andreas came there, and it's pretty amazing, the growth. So, Andreas, do you want to talk about yeah, that award? Yeah, that was a nice award. We just came from... Uh, uh, AMP, the, this is the cancer conference in Phoenix, and we got this awarded. It's a, it's a recognition for the advancements we made on the NGS side, and you know, uh, of course, uh, it you know, it ultimately our success is now measured by you know, it's measured by the success we have in the marketplace. But you know, this is the team was very happy. We're actually going out and have a dinner all together for that. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, Sharon, thank you very much for bringing it up. I mean... <laughs> Sharon's with the Montana Bioscience Alliance. So yeah. she's shining an appropriate spotlight on yes. Montana bioscience companies. Thank you, Sharon. Well, with the last few, oh, go ahead, Sharon. We have um, one of the people on the line is um, Dee Dee Dalkey. That, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, who started a new uh, lab tech program in. Um, in at um, Bozeman at um, Gallatin College. Dee Dee, I don't know if you want to talk about what you're doing there. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, my my camera's not on. I'm kind of recovering from COVID, but um, yes. Yeah, so we're we're starting a new uh, one year certificate program um, in the fall of 23. And um, I'm super excited about it because it'll it'll um, you know train students not only in the research realm of labs but also in the clinical realm. So where we're seeing kind of um, some some need in that industry um, area. So um, would love to chat with anybody that that is interested in helping out with that program. Maybe uh, just uh, recruitment, if you will, or is interested in. in um, assisting in um, the student externship hours uh, as that's a portion of the program as well. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. Fantastic. I would so to close, I would just like to give um, each of our panelists sort of a couple of sentences. If you had, you know, one word of advice to someone coming up that wants to get into biotech, what might you say to them in just a few sentences? And let's go, um, Karen, Moses, Andreas. I would say to them, uh, get started and remember that confidence often comes on the back end. <laughs> I 
I would say, you know, work hard, uh, practice creativity. I, I would almost say try, try other fields that are non-science to sort of help with your creativity, like playing music or singing in a choir or, you know, doing art or drawing or painting. Um, I think those things kind of help, help shape, you know, creativity and, and thinking skills. So um, those are the things I would say, work hard, be creative, um, ask yourself in biotech, what is the need of what, of what you're doing? Um, if there's some novel idea. Thank you, Moses. And I know you have to go, so if you need to leave, go ahead. And Andreas? Um, <clears throat> I can maybe answer this more from an entrepreneurial perspective, because uh, what I noticed that um, scientists, they we, we can sometimes be just enamored with the technology or the science we do. Um, I would have uh, three areas of focus. Uh, it's first important to identify a um, a, a product or a test that makes sense in your market that you have access to. And you have to think about this. It's not just the what's on Vogue, really what can you sell realistically? And then very important, um, that's the second one, um, have from the very get-go a clear understanding of what your operating margins uh, are or are going to be and be very diligent about this because you can forget about this very quickly if you're just motivated or interested by the science. And then thirdly, think about the scaling up of all of this as you are uh, as you're progressing. And if you have those three things, if you have your portfolio of products, tests, whatever it is, if you have a good grip on this, and if you understand what your operating margins are, and you have a scalability path to scalability, then you have an actually a chance for a, for a profitable business. And um, reminding scientists that that's the secret of uh, capitalistic success is sometimes all it takes. Excellent advice. Thank you to Karen, Moses, and Andreas. And thank you to the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative for partnering with us. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website and also emailed out to everyone who registered. And this event is part of a series that the Alliance is hosting in partnership with the Bioscience Cluster Initiative. You can find the full schedule at mthitech.org events. And thank you everyone for joining us today.